are we are we okay? Helen, we're about to start. Because we've got about three different audiences, virtual, Zoom and us. So we need to sync the watches. Okay, so welcome to Cyber Salon. Thank you very much for coming. Very, very, very excited on what's to reveal today. And it's great to see few new faces, but also people we haven't seen from before COVID. So hello, you survived. I'm very happy. Uh, and uh, just to say a couple of words. Uh, so we are Cyber Salon for the new uh, guests. And we have been going for quite a few years campaigning for Digital Bill of Rights campaigning for improvement of privacy online. Uh, and we have also been involved recently with online safety bill, trying to make it better. Uh, it will have the next reading in House of Commons next week, so watch out for that. Uh, I'm currently involved in the improvement of democracy program. Uh, I don't know if you spotted, but Gordon Brown has issued his proposals. Uh, Gina Miller has responded, and now everyone else is responding. So I'm not quite sure if we come out of it with better democracy, but we will be very active on it. Uh, so tonight, it's, a, it's quite a very special night, and I'm super excited about it. This is our fifth Christmas event in uh, New Speak House. So very big thank you to Ed for consistently bearing with us and hosting it and being amazing. So Ed is there. And so I've got a little present for Ed from uh, one of our collaborators, Douglas Rushkoff, who uh, wrote this uh, book and he gave an dedication for Ed. Thank you for bringing people together. Thank you. Yes. That book came all the way from New York. Very special. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's very easy to do things online, but you know, keeping the space together and keeping the community together, particularly for COVID, has been quite a feat. So bravo to Ed. Uh, and also, this place runs as a, as a club, as a fellowship club. So if anybody wants to join, uh, Ed is a person to talk to and you get access to great events and so uh, you can cooperate on projects about um, politics and technology or technology and politics, depending on what you prioritize. Uh, and there is a very nice support community that can take you on the journey. Uh, so we're very proud to be associated with this because they have been truly amazing and particularly for COVID, um, inspirational. So for tonight, we've got a great program for you. Uh, we've got three things going on today. So obviously games and governance. Uh, as the democracy is increasingly under pressure, we wanted to examine what games can do to increase and improve our democratic engagement, and our sense of governance and skills of governance. We all love playing games, but does the skill of organizing yourself online transfer to real life? We're not entirely sure, but tonight is the night to ask. So we've got great lineup for you. So we've got Stefan uh, from Middlesex University, who is going to speak a little bit about the context of that. Uh, and we've got three amazing reviewers. So Carolina will, will show us Mesmer, uh, Ben Greenaway, the trolley program, and Simon Sargisson from Improbable will talk about um, uh, Disco uh, Elysium. Uh, and then we will have Hali Donto, who is actually launching a virtual gallery show in uh, Cafe Siberia, which we've built in virtuality with Karen and her team, uh, supporting the northern economy. <coughs> we're very happy to, to show you today sort of like a beta version. So let me just quickly start. So uh, we've been busy over COVID building a Siberia Cafe in VR. So you can have a play with it on the uh, with headsets. So this is exactly what Siberia Cafe looked like in mid nineties. Uh, some of you, I think, uh, uh, of the old ilk that still remember it. So we just wanted to rescue for the next generation. And you can see that it was a it was a fairly low key building on uh, Whitfield Street, just behind Good Street Station, where we have uh, cafe and computers. And it was in the time before people had laptops and way before Wi-Fi. So if you wanted to join your friends online, you pretty much had to come to Siberia. Uh, so we were lucky enough to manage to get a little bit of uh, uh, plans of the space to rebuild it, and it's exactly how it was. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about the legality of it, because we now own 39 Whitfield Street in VR, and I'm sure the owner is not uh, delighted about it, but you know, I will defer. So. <laughs> 
so that's what it looked like, and people would come to the cafe, and there would be, like, in tonight's space, you will have cyber hosts, people welcoming them, and getting them online, getting them to use email. And that first email was called Eudora, and was quite difficult to use. And then obviously a lot of people wanted to download games on FTP, which was even harder to use. So we spent a lot of time trying to show people how to use it. But you know, very quickly, they kind of got the hang of it. And uh, the clocks are here, they are the real clocks that were in, in the cafe back in the 90s, because we had about 30 Siberias, all the way from Tokyo, uh, Bangkok, Manila, to Paris, London, Manchester, <coughs> Edinburgh, the most important Edinburgh. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, we, we were always trying to work with them and these clocks were actually really necessary to remember who is who and where and when we're doing the joint events it was really hard we were i think the first generation who actually really had to work cross many time zones so we kind of got it but quite often you know somebody was in the pajamas and other people were partying in back home it's just completely crazy but you know we did it and it was all possible so, uh, so this is Karen, her VR self, Karen here. So this is her mortal shell and her virtual in instant incarnation, and Dan who built it. And uh, our computers, pretty much as they were. So Frankie here, Frankie Wave. Uh, Frankie is the photographer who has just uh, worked on his uh, master thesis for documentary <coughs> photography, and he pretty much recreated this in real environment in London College of Communication. So we bought these amazing computers from someone on eBay, uh, you know, like old, uh, old Mark and Hewlett Packard and just put it together like that. And that gave me the idea really from your project that we actually should build it because then we can have event space. And even better, you see that little rounded portal that goes back to our other virtual space. So you can hop from one space to another space. So that space we use for our book, so you can see the book on the table. We've launched a book tonight, and we've, uh, a few months ago, and we launched it in virtual space. So we're kind of getting to the point that we're really beginning to understand the hybrid and the hopping from one place to another. And the interesting thing is when we were um, building it, because it's still a little bit of beta, we forgot to lock the door. And suddenly there was me, Karen, down, Ben in the space, and this lady shows up. He's like, oh my God, who's that? And you know, this sort of strange sense that you are in your bedroom, in your pajamas, with your headset on. Yet, you know, I was there in the space with her, and she showed up because we left the event uh, code open, and because there was about five of us in the space, we were trending, which, which just goes to show how many people are using cyber <laughs> virtuality because we were trending. And she's, oh, you know, I heard this is a really hot event here. It's like, okay, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> so we quickly regrouped and then, you know, Ben stay here, I looked after her, turned out to be uh, one of the early UX designers from South Carolina. She's my best buddy now. <laughs> and she was probably in her pajamas in South Carolina. Um, so this was us preparing the space, and you know, you give it a few minutes, and as you can see, this is Ben, and your brain really makes that connection very quickly. So it was Ben, and it was Carol, and you kind of like get, get into the groove of it very, very quickly. So then we introduced Caridonto. He was in the space building his uh, um, exhibition, which we'll show you later. Uh, and again, I hadn't seen his avatar before, but it took me a split second, and yeah, that was Halidonto, I could work with him, and, and we, we managed to make that leap. And the interesting thing is the hands, you know, the avatar doesn't have much to do actions, but it has hands. And when you hug or you shake hands, it's really meaningful. You know, your brain just completely gets on with it. So, you know, my son's dad is abroad quite far away, and when I give him a hug in cyberspace, it feels like a hug. <laughs> so we know where probably where people take it. I want to go there. But <coughs> there is a sense of intimacy is quite intent. <coughs> so just to finish it off, uh, from my point of view, what you will see later today with Harry Donta's work, uh, the good thing is that we are kind of beyond body. The VR gets you beyond body because, you know, like whether you're small or whether you're tiny, or whatever shape or color, you choose who you want to be, and you need to do. You might choose to be as similar to yourself as you are, or you might choose to be something completely different. You're free to roam, 
but it sort of leaves their physical attributes away, uh, which is quite nice. So far, people behave better on Twitter, <laughs> which is, you know, normal, but I think it's because you're there with presence and also the communication is reasonably limited. But you could be rude if you choose to, but so far we've been researching quite hard and people are amazingly polite. So maybe it's because early days and people are still quite bohemian and a lot of academics, but so far, good manners. Fingers crossed it stays that way. Uh, no planning permission required. So when we were building the space, we've chosen not to build it as part of the street. Uh, we just taken the building and we hooked it in a kind of like a nebula floating gal galaxy space because we didn't really want other spaces, you know, we just want it to be nice and clean. So you can pick a building you like and, you know, put it on Mount Everest or on Angkor Wat on the lake. I mean, it's just really quite a sense of freedom and you don't need to check with the planners, it's yours to build. So a lot of people build like crazy stuff, but a lot of people actually rebuild the buildings that they like because they might disappear, they might be taken over by developers. Uh, so that was one idea that we're following now. Uh, I talked about the empathy potential and also learning and retention. Whatever you learn in, in physical, in virtual space, it's quite intense, so it stays with you. So for uh, people like you know, my son there and Sachin who are doing the A-levels, I'm pretty sure that very soon that will be used for education because it's, the potential is so big and you can use virtuality to promote models, to present models, but you learn, whatever you see there, you will remember forever. Um, I think few of you had the experience first time today, so the sort of VR virgins, and I, I think you will remember that. So I hope you remember the best possible way. But obviously, as always, there are cons. Uh, the governance, which is the topic of today, it's a bit tricky because uh, the virtual platforms, they have different rules, different T's and C's, different approach to surveillance, and it's all a little bit raw at the moment. Uh, nobody really knows who owns what, but some platforms are trying to own your environment. So if you submit the files, you might find that you know your space has been hijacked and made into you know something that you don't want it to be made into. So that's that's a risk that we're running at the moment, and that's a considerable risk. So we've chosen to work on old space, which seems to be a little bit more protective of the artists who park their work in this environment. Um, and so even if you build your space, your ownership is not entirely assured. Uh, old space better than others is owned by Microsoft, but uh, other spaces, like spatial IO, we found out that they tend to claim your files. So, the, so who is going to decide, who is going to vote for the best treatment of your ownership? Who is going to decide on the laws? Is it going to be lots of different communities or Will we try to standardize? Those, those are questions that we have to ask ourselves, but pretty quick because it's moving fast now, particularly because you can build it so fast. So the future of VR is bright, but let's hope that we can avoid the mistakes that we made on web 2.0. Uh, okay, and on that, I will pass on to uh, Stefan, Stefan Lutschinger from uh, Middlesex University, who is here with his amazing students. Uh, introducing the next generation to the virtuality. So over to Stefan. So thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody. It's great to see you, and uh, it's always a very special event to celebrate <coughs> Christmas uh, here with you, with uh, our Cyber Salon friends at Newspeak House. Uh, I'm very proud that I got my students uh, with us today, but it's not only my students, also my line manager, Magnus Moore, has just joined us. Maybe an applause for Magnus Moore, who has brought a headset as well. Uh, who has brought a headset, who has brought a headset as well, um, so we can um, onboard as many of you um, to our wonderful exhibition um, that you, uh, Dan and Karen, have created with Holly Donto, Graham Halloway, uh, Scottish uh, VR artist, who does really absolutely outstanding work. So, um, Eva has asked me um, to kick off this evening with a very short talk um, that sort of brings together a couple of interesting points um, in relation to reason and games, civilization and play, and society and governance. <coughs> so 
So my first, um, uh, my first slide uh, presents games as the origin of uh, civilization and out of the five uh, uh, games theorists that uh, uh, we all must know, Johann Heisinger um, is the most important one and in his book Homo Ludens he concludes that civilization is in its earliest phase played. It doesn't come from play like a baby detaching itself from the womb. It arises in and as play, and it never leaves it. So um, I've uh, chosen the Hunger Games as my illustrative uh, uh, image, but I could have well chosen the Glass Beat game by Hermann Hesse, or uh, Ian Banks, the player of games, Scottish literature, and I could sort of uh, go on and on and on. But we also want to look at play as the origin of reason. So what's really interesting is, is that the Estonian philosopher Leonid Stolovich found out in the late 90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union that um, some of uh, the artifacts of the Kantiana that were transported, so the Kantiana is the archive of Kant's collected uh, writings, has not been transported to Berlin, to the um, uh, Academy of Sciences, but a couple of these items um, stayed in Tartu, the Tartu Moscow School of uh, uh, Semiotics. And one of these artifacts was his famous Tartu um, manuscript. And in the Tartu manuscript, Kant says that the origin of reason is indeed play, the playfulness of our imaginative faculties. And in this document, he provides the grand, foundational groundwork of uh, the anthropology, uh, of, of cultural anthropology and his uh, critical epistemology, the critique of uh, pure reason that we have all read. Thirdly, I want to point out the gamification as the origin of governance. <laughs> There's a, a, a quite modern angle, but um, gamification, gamification um, uh, we use typically uh, in its two meanings. Firstly, as a general process in which games and playful experiences are understood as essential components of society and culture. Walter Benjamin, Roger Calois, and Johann Heisinger the most important um, classics. But secondly, also the application of the mechanics of gaming to non-game activities to change people's behavior. So social media, the web 2.0, all of these experiences are of course highly gamified, starting with responses and with notifications. Such and such uh, uh, an amount of your friends have just done that or this. Gamification is a set of methods that aim to regulate individuals and society and that allows for effective behavior regulation via positive feedback. So this is now the interesting bit, right? So you all remember Foucault, right? The panopticon. So this idea that we are both the prison guard and the prisoner at the same time that we are watching ourselves and optimizing our behavior because we are aware that others are watching us. So remember this Foucaultian idea that now fuses, that now merges with gamification and it becomes a symptom for a new emerging mode of governmentality. Governmentality by means of the net and uh, in the crypto commons, the blockchains, blockchain constituencies. We have been talking about decentralized autonomous organizations and so on and so forth. So how do we learn to behave? <laughs> Through games. This is the Kardashian game. Yes, if you want to know how to become a successful um, member of uh, the Society of Controlled Consumption, <laughs> then, uh, 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 then this is your starting point. But of course, every, every grand vision, every dream that becomes true following Freud is what? It is a nightmare. 
and uh, the wonderful episode Nosedive. I don't know if you have, uh, uh, if you have Black Mirror fans, is a great illustration because this mode of regulation um, takes Foucault's concept of a liberal uh, governmentality to the extreme. So it's now the carrot that states the stick. The only price, of course, is total surveillance. So the question is, what can we do to combat these developments? So there's this um, very interesting article by Daphne Gragona, so you probably know her, she's based in Berlin and she is uh, involved in Transmediale, titled Counter Gamification, Emerging Tactics and Practices Against Gamification. So she asks, how can the processes of gamification and datafication be disrupted or rendered non-valid or non-reliable? How can the expropriation of user data based on the new mechanisms of capturing and quantifying stop? How can users be empowered? And do such modes of resistance exist? And how would a notion like counter gamification be defined? So some of the strategies she presents in these texts are of course using games to make these new processes of gamification visible and thereby derail them and sabotage them from within. This is a beautiful project um, uh, by <coughs> Wolfi Crystal Data Dealer. And it's an online game with the aim to become a data dealer, to steal as much data from your fellow players as possible. Um, to uh, become a data module and uh, um, to collect as many addresses and, and you know, compromising, compromising information um, that can be cross-linked with, uh, 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 with credit card data as well. So um, I think it's a, a, a very good uh, demonstration of uh, what Guy de Boer called the tournament of uh, uh, gamification or counter gamification in the words of, of Daphne. So what are these strategies? Obfuscation, over-identification, so remember Mikhail Bakhtin, the carnival book, I've mentioned the Moscow Tattoo School, desertion, exodus, you'll just leave parlor or, or leave, leave Twitter and, 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 and sort of on board by Truth Social, this was a joke, the jokes will get better. <laughs> <laughs> Hypertrophy, exposure of game mechanics, so what we call dark patterns. My students have become expert in um, working with dark patterns. So my module UX UI design for mobile and the web, uh, we have a, a, a close look at how to design deceptive patterns for uh, clickbait websites or, or fake news websites indeed. <clears throat> Degamification and reappropriation. This was a good example of reappropriation of detonimo and devaluation. So, what are the takeaways? First of all, resist ludic solutionism. Yeah, just because it says game is not necessarily cool, because the oppressors have already gamified us before we even start to think about which strategies we're going to employ to combat them. Secondly, play. Curate and share games for good, serious games, social VR that we can fill with meaning, worlds we can inhabit and make our own, and lastly, build your own games. Does anyone know what this uh, uh, is supposed to be? Is it chess? War games. Which war game is this? <laughs> which one of the which one of the Cars War Games game is this? Richard. No, it's not. Guy de Boer. is the game of war. Yeah, so it will be uh, playable on spatial. So my students are already playing it in class. Yes, we can uh, uh, <coughs> play Guy de Boer's uh, the game of war now in the VR experience. So we'll hope at the next event we'll have a, a, a proper test run and. 
Sir? Is it Cinema 4D? Blenda. It's Blenda. Blenda. Well, Blenda is the is the new kid on the block. They, have, they, haven't, put the, they haven't set out the doors correctly, have they? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't set up. I haven't set up. I haven't set up the 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 the, the pieces yet. So I haven't set up the pieces as you can no, see. I'm no, still. No um, and there are no mountains, Richard. And I'm going to show you. I'm sure going to show you exclusively <laughs> the next stage. That's not only. It's not only got mountains, but it's also the three-player version yeah. of Gideboer, the game of war, Baby. or what I call. The Baby. Copenhagen interpretation, because it's inspired by Asger Jorn. Asger Jorn, the inventor of three-sided football. So one of my dreams is to, um, to start a three-sided football league in Hendon, at Middlesex University. So if, if, some of, if some of the students, it's a much more dem democratic way of playing football, because you can always choose which of the goal you want to uh, score. <laughs> Objects in yeah, yeah. Also, also geometry nodes. You know, you can you can create on the fly uh, 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 animated uh, uh, animated geometry as well. Of course. Uh, anyway, I'll tell Fabian if he likes it. No, I need to. Uh, we guys need to get together and uh, for a three-sided uh, three-sided uh, game of war experience. I think, oh. the, Vol I think the vodka version. You could do was much better. The vodka. We can also have a three-sided vodka version. That'll be even better. But now. I'll yeah. just invite you all to ask your questions at the end yeah. when we'll have a, a, a chat and I now hand over to Cara who will be reviewing Mesmer for Yay, us. Okay. We'll be mesmerized by um, Cara. Hello, um, I'm not an academic so I have one slide. <laughs> Sorry, two. Two, I've been afraid. Oh, I, I copied one again, we didn't name it. So Thank you. Three. Thanks, Ben. Um, yes, so Ava asked me to play this game um, for the event, mainly because I spent the last six months in a hole playing Elden Ring, so just needed to get out more. Um, one of one of ways of getting out was just to get me another laptop to play a different game. Um, but it was, it was quite an interesting journey, and... Um, it, it took me by surprise, because at first I was like, oh, you know, cool, you run a government, it's kind of like Animal Crossing, less cute animals. Um, but it, it, was, it was really interesting, because you kind of come to this world that is already a nation of its own. There was rules, classes, there was your nobles, your merchants, um, and everyone in between. And you kind of slot in as your character, Tori, and kind of start realising that you're just living in a police state and the government are actually out to get you. Sounds familiar. Um, so as part of being a citizen, essentially you take it upon yourself to not only liberate yourself, but liberate your fellow citizens. And what was really interesting to me is, although if it, it is presented to you as a survival game, and I don't know how many of you have played a survival game, but I did not have to find any zombies, and that was great. Um, but it's it's not so much your own survival, but it's the community survival, which I thought was really, really interesting and a much different angle that kind of got me thinking about what I could do to help other people rather than, you know, how can I survive? How can I help myself? How can I level up? How can I kill this goddamn dragon? Um, it's, it's not so much focused on exploration either, but again, it didn't deter me from playing because the aspect of not exploring a really wide world was replaced by exploring every person that I was walking past on the street. Every person that kind of gave me a mission that would then help them, that would mean that I would go on to recruit them to my side. Um, essentially the main goal is to overthrow the state, again, sound familiar, very topical for this year, Ava. Um, and the most fascinating thing is I, I found it to be very gentle in doing so. It wasn't about you know raising troops or building a tank. It was about interacting with your fellow citizens, making them like you, bringing them cookies because they felt sad that day, and asking them to help you and working together towards a better community, towards a better government, towards a better future. Um, and I really thought 
that it, it's it's such a great way of illuminating something that we tend to forget is politics, the government, or you know how we run the world, how we run society isn't about who has the most power, it's about the community we build, it's about who we are and how we can work with other people rather than what we can get from other people. Um, so I'll leave it on that note, I thought it was a very short and sweet game. It's very replayable, so you can, you know, screw it all up and try again. Unfortunately, we don't get a chance in real life, um, <laughs> but maybe one day. Um, we can try in VR, probably. Um, but I would highly recommend it. Um, it's very sweet, and I would definitely recommend it for children as well. It's kind of a great one-on-one -on -one in politics and how to be a better leader. So, thank you. Brilliant. I like the sort of sock futurist uh, artwork of that. It reminds me home when you know, I was a young girl in Poland and that's what was on the walls. But we were on tractors so and we were supposed to do things. Uh, but on that topic of community getting together, just a very, very short uh, interjection. We were running an um, uh, auction to help uh, Camden project uh, that works with the resettled Ukrainian refugees. It's reasonably successful considering it's come then, but they need a lot more money. So we had a very, very nice and very generous submission from a bunch of artists, one from as far away as Guadeloupe, uh, and one from Mexico, Mod Arch, and we virtually put it online for about 20 minutes and we got really good bits really quickly. So we raised about 500 pounds. So Julia, we will probably share that with your team as well. But uh, you know, people are incredibly helpful and just want to do something and want to help. They're quite often just looking for ways to help. But the energy is there if we can help people to join together and do bigger things together as that game teaches. So, so on that note, I'm going to hand over to I think Ben, right? Yeah. It's always good fun. Um, one of the things about the Games for Good events, uh, however they're situated and whatever else they wrap around, it's always quite a challenge to work out what games to play. Um, this one landed on my desk in the middle of the summer. I don't know if anybody else here has played it, but I absolutely loved it. Um, so the, the setup, like, so the, you know, self-governance and better democracy for human tribes. Yeah, okay, um, where, where could we land there? I'll have to take my glasses off because I can't read the screen this distance. Um, I had a few thoughts about the trolley problem. Um, again, I'm not an academic, but these are my sort of cliff notes here. Uh, let's say our traditional top-down governance uh, has been a bit lacking in the last 20 years. Uh, the, the situation uh, in the UK at the moment with the Iron Arms Bill coming through again, which we mentioned at the top, um, it's almost like we've spent 20 years catching up on, okay, we should regulate this web thing. But yeah, let's, let's regulate this web thing. So, yeah, okay, well, we're on to a metaverse thing already. We're into a VR space already. Is that going to come in? Is that going to happen straight away? I don't know. Well, what about self-regulation? Well, again, it's 20 years. These companies could have sorted it out themselves. And they've not managed to. So I'll take any other kind of participatory option for governance. Thank you very much. Uh, so that, I thought, yeah, that'll work. Didn't quite cover why I wanted to talk about trolley problem, but we'll get there. Um, and then, yeah, how do we get our better democracy? Well, if more participation is good, uh, which I think we all agree with, uh, and our pluralism is something we want to go for, which again, I think we all want to want to agree with that, then you know we're going to need to see things in more than just the red and the blue, uh, red, blue, yellow, green, and those kind of single track things. And now I'm sort of thinking, yeah, oh, that's a trolley problem. That sounds more like a trolley problem kind of thing. So with that, we kind of know where we start with this, right? It's the classic philosophical ethical dilemma. Do you pull the lever or don't you? And you get clever. It's like, well, what about not pulling the lever, just being opting out of the game? Who knows? But imagine my joy when over the course of this summer, this snappy little indie game was released. And it was capable of utterly ridiculing the false dilemma dichotomy that this is, while at the same time putting some very current and varied moral concerns for our digital age slap bang in front of you when you're playing it. And that, for me, was trolley bombs. This is just a bunch of collective memes. It's 
Sonny, we were talking about Douglas's book here as well. One of the things that he takes from the mindset, the, the billionaire escapist mindset, is just how ridiculous we should all find it. We should laugh it off the face of our reason. And that's what the trolley problem did to me. So, the setup of the game, I'll fly through some slides really quickly so you get a vibe for it. The setup of the game is you are now working for Trolley Problem Incorporated, its subsidiaries, its holding companies, and finally, in Act 4, your inner self. No spoilers, but it does get a bit red, blue, red pill, blue pill towards the end. So, there's a setup, very simple. Bunch of very simple single screen panels. So, if we're talking about making our own games, how hard would it be to make this? So, it all comes down to the narrative, the story, and the logic. Each piece of graphics is just literally what you're seeing on the screen. Tiny animation of that thing moving from the left to right as that timer which starts at 30 seconds and counts down in milliseconds reaches zero it reaches zero just when the green line ends so as you are either you've chosen yellow do nothing or you've chosen red pull the lever and yeah on the tracks are five people unable to move you are next to a lever if you pull the lever the trolley will switch to a different set of tracks however there is a person on the tracks so each of these problems is narrated to you by the voice Adding new extra statements. Oh, you're going to do nothing? 15 seconds to this event. Ah, well, I guess you're right. The more people who die, the better. Seven seconds to decide. So do you pull the button or not? And you do or you don't. And I kind of did. And he goes, well, I hope that person's friends and family will forgive you. And I didn't. And then I could choose the other option. And, well, at the end of every single level, you get a scorecard. It basically tells you, you know, how you did. Uh, it also quite interestingly tells you whether you agree with other people that did the same thing or not. Uh, the second and third lines there, so the, these two. It wasn't until my third or fourth playthrough that I worked out what those are. Those are actually other players that you either know or have agreed to play with. So those are all vers previous versions of myself as I was playing this too. You're asked to <laughs> sign the disclaimer. Here's the disclaimer. You're asked to sign this disclaimer at the beginning of the game. And I, I didn't one time, and I did the other time, but it basically signs your sort of acceptance of, how does it put it? My understanding and agreement to endorse every decision that I make. I think well, that's a good guiding principle to, to run a democracy. So yeah, as you play through, you're effectively with a team of friends showing what you've agreed to or disagreed. And you know, it's not gory, it's not violent, it's not gross, but it is putting you in that really awkward little position um, I say it's like four, so there's four acts, two or three weeks worth of work for the different companies in, in each act, and a seven day working week, so no labor rights here. <laughs> so, that's day one, the classic trolley problem. As we know, those things always escalate, so week two, sorry, week one, Tuesday, first principle of responsibility. Here's Polly, she's five years old, while she loves to play in the sand with her dolls, she dreams of looking after the world. Bless you, Polly. Polly's destiny is to grow up to be a great doctor. More of us should take a leaf out of the book. There you go, sir. A trolley is heading towards another five people. You're next to a lever. If you pull this lever, the trolley will derail and descend down a hill heading for the park sandpit. It's a nice safe place to park a runaway trolley. Except you notice that Polly is in the sandpit, sculpting her dream hospital. So it's, it progresses almost exactly as you'd hope it would. It gives you a chance to save her, or not, it's entirely up to you. But if you don't, then you kill another five people. So this is exactly how it goes. In this instance, I think, yeah, I pulled the lever. I unlocked the achievement of killing Polly, which I was very proud of. And other times you take different answers. But that's the setup. So again, you get a different scorecard at the end of each one. Apparently, slightly more people do or don't kill Polly, I can't remember how this one really um, And the scorecard, the death count just climbs and climbs with every level. It's, it's really good fun. So anyway, um, a quick aside into the problems of magic. Sorry, and agency. Did I mention agency? So the problems of magic. Yeah. I often find it quite hard when I'm playing a game, particularly one that's asking me to have like a role in the narrative. What on earth's going on? When I get to choose to pull lever or not, a very simple binary choice, I, I can kind of understand what's going to happen. I might not like what's going to happen, but I understand what's going to happen. This, for those of you that don't know it, is The Witcher 3. This was literally the game that I was playing immediately before I picked up Trolley Problem. And I loved it, but 
but I also hated some parts of it. This is a long-standing conversation with Simon and I that we try to pick out in these games with good stories. Is what happens with narrative and agency? If we're talking about games, how, how do you tell a story? Is it like a novel you just read from page one to page one plus one and one plus one plus one and happily go through that? Or do you need to be able to change the story? I get FOMO. I get really bad fear of missing out when a narrative branches into 20 different directions. I don't know if I have to play the game again all 20 times. And that's compounded when the world is full of magic. Because I thought it'd be really cool to not kill this mystery monster under the tree, because, you know, why kill a thing? And it killed other things when I let it live, and then other things happened. And so this long chain of agency problems, which when I'm playing Pac-Man, I don't get. Because when I turn left, I go left. Even when I go through that little warp tunnel and fall off the end of the world, I know where he's coming from. Anyway. Polly, if you don't kill her, you save her. And five people die. You know, did they have kids? Were any one of them kids? You don't know. That's the constraint of the game. So when you're choosing your narrative pieces, just on the whole making game story, I really like the play with agency that comes up in a game that has seemingly no choice, but actually all the choices. Congratulations, you got a promotion. You now work for Trolley Health Corporation. THC is a stoic, focusing, uh, is, is stoic. It focuses more on justice, temperance, and courage, and wisdom. So an upgrade to your moral fiber. Today you are in A&E. A young male has come in from a car accident, urgently needs a heart transplant. There is only one in the hospital, and this heart is scheduled to be given to an elderly man waiting upstairs who will surely die if you give it to the young chap. I love this game. <laughs> Today you have five patients. Each need a different organ, but no organs are available. A healthy young traveler comes in for a routine checkup. Their organs are compatible with all five dying patients. Do you kill the tourists and use their organs to save the five in a desperate need? That's one life for five, which actually is the same equation you took in the... So anyway, as the, the, the very amusing sort of narrator voice over the top just says, they're probably just on their way to chug like a husker and get culturally appropriate. <laughs> it's, it's really very British humour, but very good fun. So, uh, a second segue, um, really great work, Stefan, with the, the setup and the how do I play away a game and how can I avoid gamification in politics. I've really enjoyed that. Um, I, I have to make the little philosophical criticism of the trolley problem in general here. It's only fair. Um, you may have seen, there's a really great YouTube argument. It's a guy who turns up at certain, I can't remember the philosopher's name, but a certain moral philosopher's public lectures who often uses the trolley problem to explain how, like, lost, confused, Rawls. disempowered. What? Rawls. Perhaps it is. Okay, yeah. He, sure he, he Great. And, and the guy who stands up, he just, he's, he's criticizing his voice. This is insane. Who put that trolley there in the first place? Why was, why am I given control over the damn thing? Like, so the entire setup is ludicrous. It is extreme. It is unconnected with the real life moral situations. It can't be useful. It can't be educational. In fact, to even set that up makes me think and makes you think that there is no empathy that we have a mandate to decide who lives and dies. That's not how politics works. We don't have a mandate to decide who lives and dies. There are different, more subtle choices to be made. Um, the great criticism that's sitting on the Wikipedia page that says that, you know, this is a horror show that I've just been thrust into. I have no meaningful agency in the trolley problem. Something's gonna go horribly wrong. And it does in each of the seven days of the three weeks of each of the four acts of this game, and it's great. So yeah, that was, I mean, I won't tease the whole game. That was just act one. This is act two. Now we start playing with self-driving cars. Now we start driving with AI engines and subscription models. Should I make the AI kill fewer people and protect you more if you pay a higher subscription fee to your AI in the car? It really does jump outside of like the normal space in Acts 2 and Acts 3 and 4, and it keeps going. Because <coughs> it isn't a philosophy lecture. You know, it, it is a game, and it is an entertainment. It's, a, it's an indie piece, it's, it's one guy that set it up. I heartily recommend you go and, go and grab it. Um, if you 
do want to deep dive into any of it. Every single one of the levels has a very well documented reading list for where the moral dilemma was first set up, including as you get into the later levels, like, you know, the cover up problem, Trump D and Schwartz F, 1987, Trump the Art of the Deal. So you can imagine where it sort of heads. There's a couple of good references to some Tesla projects as well. Um, you know, but equally, you know, ancient Greece. Um, there you go. Uh, reviews, it was a bit under the radar. Um, Simon Parkin in the Guardian called it a thrill ride into the world of ethical dilemmas. Martin Gardner and Forbes called it 2022's most important game. And I'm tempted to agree with you, but it won't make game of the year list. And you'll probably hate it. So um, anyway, that's it. Will playing Trolley Problem Inc. necessarily make society a better place? Probably not. But I'm confident it'll make you a more unsettled member of it. And hopefully one more willing to ask questions and less willing to accept the simple answers. Thank you. This very much sounds like uh, tri triaging in the hospitals during the COVID. Uh, so we have one more game to review, then we get some more drinks, and then we have a short panel. So if I can hand over to Simon, who has been busy playing this coalition. Correction, I, I have already played Disco Elysium, I just want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Disco Elysium, pivoting over the edge of reality, I'm going to use this game as a framework to talk about, uh, or to touch upon really, not really to talk and discuss deeply, but just to talk about the approach a game can take to think about politics and social movements and your personal choices in it. So Disco Elysium, it's a great game, it came out in 2019, they've improved it since. Um, you should all play it. Right, so I'll set up what the game is about. Um, it's fairly involved, it's fairly deep. Uh, you start as a deadbeat detective, investigating a murder you don't remember being assigned to. It doesn't sound overly political yet, but wait, we'll get there, we'll get there. Uh, you don't know where you are, you don't know your name, you don't even know what your face looks like. So this is like proper, we're in proper tabula rasa territory, right? You're a blind slate, a very common trope in, uh, in video games, very useful. They do it in films as well, you know, it helps set the scene, it helps you identify with a character and kind of go on that journey with them. It's, it's extremely useful for a game that needs to teach you how to play it, but it's also kind of interesting in the context of the subject that we're talking about. Um, and it turns out it's also actually a pretty intriguing way of exploring themes of governance, community and morality, as well as a whole bunch of other things that I probably, yeah, I won't talk about here because it's, it's too big of a game. I can't cover it all. Uh, so you start out like this, naked, hungover, uh, barely, yeah, barely clothed. You, you don't remember the, oh, okay. maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll just take it. How about that? Uh, yeah, barely clothed. Um, you don't remember your name. Uh, you, you're not wearing any clothes. You're clearly not in the greatest of states. So, this collision, what kind of game is it? It's an RPG, right? You control a nameless character, and it has all the common elements of an RPG, a role-playing game. So you have a skill system with various strengths and weaknesses, which grow over time. Um, if you're familiar with the genre, pretty standard stuff. An inventory st uh, system, stuff that you carry with you, that you can uh, outfit your character with, you're not going to be almost naked all the time, unless you really want to, which you could do. And various items that have uses. You know, you could think of guns, but also, you know, maybe crowbars, other things, things that allow you to interact with your environment. It also has, as quite common in RPGs, a dialogue system. And uh, the dialogue system is actually the main focus of this collision. And it allows you to explore various topics with Elysium's many, many characters. All right, interesting. Okay, so it's about talking to people. Maybe we're getting a little bit closer to the, you know, maybe we can discover something about people and then maybe they're connected to some kind of, you know, politics. We'll, we'll, we'll get there as I said. Okay, so uh, if you're familiar with the tropes, um, you'll see that the skills are quite unusual. Uh, in traditional RPGs, you have wisdom, strength, dexterity, intelligence, all these other things. Um, and you kind of distribute points, and you're good in some and not in the others. Um, but instead, these are all weird. And they don't explain themselves, and they have to be uncovered. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the set, and you'll see what I mean, right? 
So we have logic, okay, encyclopedia, or a little bit weird rhetoric, kind of cool, drama, conceptualization, that's kind of a bit weird, visual calculus, okay, volition, I don't know what that is, England Empire, cool movie, don't know what it does as a, as a skill, but empathy, okay, okay, authority, the speed of course, don't know what that is, suggestion, well, anyway, you get the point, there's lots of these, um, they're also not necessarily all that useful, as you'll discover. Um, you know, uh, my favorite one, let's see where we have electrochemistry, that's your affinity to drugs. And it's not that useful, but you can have it. You leveled it up quite a oh, bit. It is useful. This is not my playful. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is in London. Uh -huh. It is in London. Sorry. What, what is the character sheet picture? The character sheet picture. This, this is perception. This is an abstract visualization of perception, apparently. Uh, yeah, the, the, the old art is really, really beautiful. It's done by uh, somebody who makes beautiful concept arts. It's kind of evocative and weird. Um, it, yeah, it's kind of an interesting, dark, you know, slightly gross game, but um, I think it's quite pretty. Cool. You also have an inventory system. But unlike the cool armor and helmets and whatever you get in normal games, you mainly get to dress in a, very, a variety of outlandish ways. Um, you know, with very questionable fashion sense, if we're totally honest. You're, you're obsessed with being disco pop, which is definitely something you can pursue if you want. Uh, and also items, but not, not, you know, you have a gun, you can find a gun, it's quite rare, but you can find a gun. But, you know, you may have weird things like a tie that you can talk to. And that's where England Empire comes in. If you have a high level of that skill, you're tied, we'll start having discussions with you. Uh, Again, no, it doesn't, it's not immediately apparent, like, how is this useful? Um, but you will find out. And yet here we can see the time I discussed. It has a weird pattern. Um, and you can see this is, a, this is definitely the outfit of somebody who is who's going to make things happen. Right. So, you know, how do you play the game? How do you interact with it? So you explore. Uh, the fictional neighborhood of Martinez in the city of Rochelle, which is also fictional. And you can see, you start to see the outgoings of uh, both individuals' experience. Oh, I didn't quite, okay. Well, anyway, that sentence was meant to be something else. But like, you both the sort of like the collective and individual experience of law and lawlessness. Uh, you know, you are part of a volunteer led police force called. The uh, Revachal Citizens Militia, which is based on no nations, which is already quite old. The Union in the area has its own de facto police force in the shape of a couple of sort of, yeah, quite muscly guys called the Hardy Boys. Um, and everybody in the area is touched by a failed communist revolution, as people will tell you over and over again, some as participants, some as victor, or simply as a bystander, or like with second generation influence. And the whole place is steeped in a deep sense of history um, that you will experience through your encyclopedia skill, for instance, or the various books that you can read, or in particular the conversations that you will have. So because it's such a dialogue-heavy game, it's kind of like exploring uh, an oral history where people will tell you things, and you can choose to talk to certain people and suggest certain things or not do certain things, and you can also read a lot of other things. Uh, so yeah, here we can see that you know we're part of the, the, the volunteer uh, police brigade. Um, this is our partner. This is us. You can see this is a particularly healthy-looking individual. Uh, uh, and here we're, we're calling the, the station that in our drunken bout we have misplaced our badge. We have also incidentally misplaced our car uh, and, and, and our gun, uh, which will come up later in the game. Uh, and here, uh, you know, we can see some of the Hardy Boys, which are kind of like, you know, this kind of controlling faction. You're, you're, it's kind of weird, you're kind of, you know, kind of a traditional police force, but you don't really have that much power here. Um, again, it kind of puts like the familiar on a bit of an edge. And uh, yeah, here we can see somebody who's actually fought in the, uh, against the communist revolution and who is now sort of sitting out his day playing uh, Pentuck with, a, with a, uh, one of his friends who used to be a socialist. Um, so in essence, what, what, what this Collegium allows you to do is like 
you know, it has like a setup and you might have some thoughts about it, but you can see that, you know, both things that we sympathize with and, and we don't, they all have positive and negative effects depending on who you talk to. And those effects ripple out in time, like the kind of like middle of the roadway <coughs> is like the moral intern, which is like an internationalist bureaucratic movement that swept the whole uh, world of Elysium. And it seems even handed, it seems fair, but it's also deeply con condescending and bureaucratic. It's kind of like an IMF or like a UN. You know, it, it's really obsessed with appearing moral, but it also in some ways is deeply problematic. And I think the game really, really leverages the fact that, you know, it's, it's using this kind of tabula rasa format where you don't really have a position in, in, this, in this world and you kind of get to explore it anew without the really heavy context of maybe exploring that in a real setting or reading a history or something like that. And then also using the functional nature to kind of really twist some of the familiar elements uh, of these things um, so that you might be able to see kind of like a slightly different perspective on things without kind of really like revisiting old pathways immediately. So I think it really, really uses the fact uh, that is fictional to great effect. And here we can see the Sunday French uh, friend who is obviously French uh, with, with some glasses. And you know, he, he's here saying something about price stability, which definitely sounds like something that somebody from the IMF would say. Uh, and he also says that Martinez is beyond hope, you know, they haven't found civilization yet. Again, it sounds kind of familiar. Um, and also it is a game. So it's not just a fiction, not just a book, a fiction or a film or a movie, but it's also something that you can play, right? And <coughs> It's interesting that, you know, Ben talked about this and, you know, I've talked about this previously that in sort of slightly different context, but agency does make it different. It makes you a participant, it makes you kind of experience, you know, not high stakes, you're playing a game, but still you, you experience uh, the effects of your choices and some people might talk to you and some people might die and other things, you know, the things you do reverberate. You know, that's an experience you don't really get in a more kind of static type of uh, fiction. And, you know, it can empower you, it can make you vulnerable, and it can open and close uh, avenues. So it's not like like a fully rounded view either, right? It's not like a, you know, like a book or a film that's trying to show you all perspectives or a bouquet. No, you actually have to choose. There's lots of on offer, but you have to choose a path. And unless you replay the game, you are actually stuck with that, those choices. Uh, and this is also really, really influenced by what you wear uh, and, and what abilities you choose. Like if you have high encyclopedia knowledge, you get lots of history, which means there's more reading. And if you're like a you know, strong guy, you kind of you know, punch your way through the world, which will definitely give you a different experience of both people in the world. Uh, so yeah, here we can we, we can see some of our interaction uh, with the Hardy Boys, and uh, yeah, the other thing that kind of brings in is also an element of chance, right? So it's not just choices, but there is also randomization, and those things have real consequences. Like if you lose this kind of dice roll, it's affected by your skills, but it's not a hundred percent chance, and it's unfortunate, right? You might lose something, you might be really set up, you might have seventy-two percent chance to succeed, but you don't. And then suddenly a person won't talk to you, you won't get the thing that you want. Um, so it kind of really mixes uh, this idea of chance and choice. Uh, you know, and also not all chance is explicit. Some things will only appear if you have the correct sills or you like win a secret, secret roll of the die. Um, and uh, so yeah, some chance is explicit, some is implicit and you won't know. Right? You just have to discover it. And again, I think it's like a nice parallel, right? It highlights the political outcomes, you know, you know, and you can align with a certain faction. You can be a communist or you can become a fascist if you want, or an ultra liberal or um, what they call the moral intern, which is kind of more of an internationalist movement. Uh, 
you know, and these are all directed by your choices, but they're all so influenced by chance. Again, highlighting not only agency, but also uh, randomness and kind of combining them. So yes, you have a higher chance if you're more, have more affinity to something, which definitely shapes the overall, um, the overall arc, but it doesn't necessarily give you all of those choices all of the time. Uh, and it also lets you live with these unearned successes and failures. So sometimes, you know, you might not have the right skill, but you might have a lucky roll and you might roll into something. <coughs> Again, I think quite an interesting way of looking at this subject. Uh, so here we can see, you know, we're trying to conf uh, comfort uh, somebody and we, we fail and then we feel sad. Um, so, the game invites you, and this is a little bit of a poetic influence in the game as well, it kind of uses a quote, a bigger quote of this. You, you partake in a shifting identity, you are this drunk, this amnesiac, um, who doesn't really have a personality of his own except for like a vague affinity to disco, and it allows you to kind of like uh, play around with that. So it has like a corrupted lens, and it presents a a world with history of politics that seems familiar, but it's quite different. And, you know, ultimately the, this presentation barely really scratches the surface of the layer depth of the game. There are cryptids and cryptozoologists, there is the ever-expanding nothingness, nothingness that is the pill, there is the whole universe, there is the enigma of the pill popping disaffected outside the class here, who is somehow involved, and there's the wild pines group who is pulling the strings in the background. You'll just have to find out for yourself. I highly, highly, highly recommend that you get play the game. There's so much to it, so much loving depth and detail. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought it was a really, really interesting, provocative game. Okay, great. We are going to have a little break, so get yourself a drink. Uh, and the ones who haven't tried the VR, try the VR. And then we'll have a short panel with uh, Hali Donto, who is going to talk about his uh, virtual art and the exhibition we did in Siberia. And you will have an opportunity to ask questions, and Luke will be moderating. And Luke is the best moderator ever, so you really want to be part of that. You have a go. It's great that the, the PA Digital Media and Communications uh, teaching team is uh, here tonight. Yeah, amazing. And welcome, welcome. Lovely to see you here. Uh, okay, we're going to have a, a, a quick panel following up on the debate. So we've got uh, Hali Donto, who has uh, created a created very, very beautiful work uh, that we very honored to have in the Cyber Cafe, in the space. Uh, can we show it, Carol, if we can get rid of the... This is what we're seeing. So we're seeing Cyber Cafe inside from the point of view of the bar. And we've seen visitors, so that, and few visitors there. And it's projected on the wall inside the Cyber Cafe. So it's space in the space in the space. It's a bit of a class but it's fine. <laughs> uh, so we just wanted to maybe start from uh, introducing Luke, who is a great friend of ours, and he's, he's been in the space of future for for a very long time, so he remembers various history of future, so people used to talk about future before. We still talk about future, hopefully we have one. So he's going to gather us around today and moderate, and uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. I, I've never been to Siberia until tonight, and tonight is is oddly trippy. Uh, I revived the, the mid-90s cyber culture conference, Virtual Futures, in, in 2011, and at the time that that happened, 1995, I was about five years old. Uh, so the only way I could find out what it was like in the mid-90s that the emergence of this thing called cyberspace was to visit Siberia. 
But the Siberia I visited was a book that I found in the library by an author who's come up multiple times tonight, Douglas Rushkoff. His version of Siberia gave you a context to what was going through the minds of the people, the early sort of psychonauts and, and cyber uh, explorers at the time. It was after reading that book that I found out there was another Siberia. A Siberia, which was a physical uh, place here in London, run by, by Ava uh, Pascoe. And it wasn't until months later did I realize that that building still exists. And I took a little spiritual uh, pilgrimage there. I uh, wandered around uh, the area behind uh, Good Street Station and found the Siberia building. And then shortly after, I would find the cyber curious individuals of Cyber Salon and find that unlike virtual futures, which had somewhat died, Cyber Salon was still vital. It was still, it was still um, alive. And, and it's not so weird and interesting because of having having imagined what it would have been like to be in Siberia and then to have gone virtually into Siberia and, and to be surrounded by, by figures that were so influential about a decade ago, Douglas Rushkoff and of course Ben Greenaway. And Ben Greenaway ties together the gaming element of what we're talking about tonight because I'm going to let you into a little secret. When I first met Ben, <laughs> When I first met Ben, I was about 20 years old and Ben was living in Oakland, California. And I'd been introduced to Ben by some of the original Virtual Futures crew and they were told to go see Ben, he's very nice. So I go meet Ben in, in Oakland and we, we hang out in California and we drink lots and lots of IPA and it, it gets to about uh, two, three in the morning and, and Ben's been regaling me with these stories of what the mid-90s was like and how uh, incredible it was as a, as a place of creation and thought. And Ben turns to me in a moment of silence and goes, uh, but let me show you what cyberspace was really like. And I go, what? And Ben goes, come into my bedroom. And I'm like, Ben, I'm not being funny, you're very nice, and then you're very sweet, but that's not really my, that's not really my thing. And, and Ben goes, don't just come into my bedroom, it, come into my closet. Sex robots! <laughs> that was the last thing that went through my head, but then you say it. So I, I wander into Ben's bedroom, a, a young man, and, uh, and walk into his closet. And in his closet, he has a little TV screen that's lit up in the corner. And that TV screen is connected to a Commodore 64. This is an American closet. American closets are the size of second bedrooms in the United States. True. So it's just like saying, go into the office. All right, well, Ben takes me to his closet. And I'm in his closet. And he switches on the Commodore 64 and he goes, if you really want to understand what it was like in the mid-90s, listen to the sounds that we were listening to as we were getting high on those crazy sorts of drugs and talking about cybernetic philosophy. So eventually I found out that to be there, you actually had to be on something, uh, or be taking something, and the real way to access VR was actually not through uh, Ben's experiments, but through uh, through the virtual reality between your ears. So it's it's an odd evening. I, I would say it's a, tonight is a very is a very trippy um, night, and I'm so fascinated by this this virtual space that you've created, this Siberia that I finally got to visit. And as Helen done so, because we haven't heard from you, I, I want to ask you: so, what does it mean to you to have your work? displayed and not just in virtual reality but, but across time there's so much history uh, that's being that, that Siberia sort of sits upon but also there's so much history being created right now and how does it feel to have your artwork represented in this new frontier in this new space um, well, um, I, well during like the pandemic um, you know, I got uh, introduced into the realms of like blockchain and NFT art so I was kind of exploring that and taking some of my older drawings um, and put them on the blockchain and, and thinking about the, the very thing you're saying about you know, the future and them lasting forever in a digital kind of, you know, a digital realm. So when I was asked to, uh, to, to do pieces for Siberia, you know, it's digital metamorphosis, you know, a lot of the works I was doing was recontextualizing a lot of my old drawings into kind of my obsessions with Byzantine and uh, Renaissance style repeated patterns. So 
and bringing this kind of, you know, the notion of the cyborg and the symbolicness of it into this, you know, contemporary state as well. And at the same time, you know, parallel in that, I've been developing, you know, an opera, which is an old form of um, an old form of immersion as well. And some of the characters, like the big sculpture Solace, is one of the characters for that I'm developing as well. So to kind of be asked to, you know, exhibit and show stuff um, of this, you know, reemergence of uh, Siberia has been an honour to do that as well, and especially the way it kind of works into the way my work is. So, yeah. Ava, I, I guess I, I want to ask you and the other folks in the panel, can we, this idea of ownership came up multiple times, can we all own a Siberian? Or do we have to come to your virtual space? How do you see the future of something like this project? Well, this was very much on my mind when we were building it, because obviously the building process is quite arduous. It doesn't happen quite like that. With all the VI, art flying around it's still like you really have to put your mind to it and the wonderful team of carol and dan who uh, implemented it have spent months building it so i think if you can spend months building your space i'm very happy for you to have another siberia i wouldn't have any problem with that but you know it's a big it's a big wonderful adventure but you can have as many instances as you want so, you know, there is no infinity, there is no limitation in, in virtuality. And, uh, you know, I work in fashion and I always tell people there is no gravity either. Nobody needs a bra in cyberspace. There is no limitation. You can, you can do whatever you want, but I think everybody will have their own space ultimately. And we might have virtual instances of places you like. So, you know, I really like Kenwood House. So I might have my next party in Kenwood House. And the fact that they own it in physical space is not going to stop me, is it? But, you know, it reminds me about the early wars about the URLs, about dot coms, like we were all rushing and registering Nike.com, and they're waiting for them to come and have to buy it back. But then the law got settled, and for a while you couldn't do this anymore, And except now, you know, all the Chinese uh, Alibaba registers, Nike store, Nike outlet, Nike everything, and the war started again. So I think the law is always behind, but I think with the generous spirit of, of cyberspace, if anybody wants to make a copy and build themselves, I wouldn't have a problem with that. So the, the ben, ben, I want to turn to you because I, I loved your analysis and your, your um, review of the trolley game. I love how uh, that you, if, if that existed in real life, you would probably be one of the people strapped to the tracks. You wouldn't actually be the person making, making the decisions. But I, I, jokingly said that you've been very formative in my experience of new virtual spaces throughout my sort of decade of exploring this but what is it specifically about gaming um a lot of the times that i've, I've explored new technology it has been through the, the uh, medium of gaming what is it about gaming that kind of opens up the possibility space of what's uh, what's possible because we see something like this we think this is a, a rendering from a game but in actual fact it's it's not a game space, is it? It's a communitarian space, so speak to that. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, no, thanks, Nick. Um, well, no, yeah, this is, this is a community space, um, but underneath it, this is Blender, you know, which is an asset built to allow people to build computer games. Um, you, you go right back, at least certainly my experience with these worlds, goes right back to the computer was interesting, and on the computer, that Commodore 64, you know, and many of them that you've seen before, you turn them on, there is nothing in them. You know, you pick up a mobile phone, you turn it on, there is a ton of stuff in it. There. there are a ton of worlds curated and, and embedded and built for you. But the, the computer itself has no form beyond what it's programmed to do. So who's been programming computers? Who, who started programming computers? What were they programmed to do that wasn't just spreadsheets and accounting calculations? The very first, one of the very first arts in computing was the game. You know, space invaders, you know, space wars. So the gamers have had computers about as long as the accountants have. It's just everything they've done is a lot more fun than accounting. So, you know, the rest of art has sort of gone and said, oh, shit, what's going on over there on that computer? On that like colourful, bouncy, noisy screen. So that doesn't look like a spreadsheet. It's not. You know, it's a Jeff Minter game, or you know, it's a it's a Neo Geo console yeah. game. You know, and so the rest of art sort of like suddenly feels like, oh shit, there's a bunch of tools because computer games are hard to build. So over the years, they've developed tools to make 
the creation of worlds like this accessible to people who don't have computer science degrees. It's, you know, it, it democratizes access to them. So uh, who knows what we'll use with them next? But a lot of the tools are there from gaming, and that was when I was way in. Simon, I want to ask you a question about being a maker of games and how that changes your review. I, lo I love when you were giving your review, you, uh, you, almost, uh, you, you almost pretended that you'd never woken up in your pants before not knowing what day of the week it was or where you were, which was sweet, I bet you have. So as someone who's actually made games and, and, and not just played them, how does that change your way of, of analysing them, looking at them, even reviewing them? Well... I, I think it is, it is like with most cultural products, like, you know, I think some part of like the magic goes away because you kind of recognize the tricks, but you also sort of like start to appreciate it. And, you know, in particular, it really makes me think about like, you know, I, you know, my two big loves are basically film and video games, you know, I'm a very traditional guy, but uh, I, I think there's something really interesting in the difference between those two, right? And actually making agency work in video games is really, really tremendously hard work, right? Because rather than confining yourself to a frame or to a particular viewpoint or maybe solving that one problem, you're actually solving a whole a possibility space, right? But what you get in return is it, really like, I think we still think about art in a very authorial sense, right? Certainly in film, like where we talk about directors and a lot, right? Like, what was the director's intent? We don't necessarily talk about the scriptwriter, although we might. We also don't necessarily talk about the set dresser or the other people kind of involved in that. And I think for, for games, we don't really talk about authors that much. And there's certainly a lot going on behind the scenes, but it also invites you into the space. So it really gives much more space to sort of like how we interact, right? We don't really see like the interpretation of art as part of the art piece, but for games that is fundamentally true, right? It's fundamentally your experience of the thing, right? And this is also what I was saying, like, you know, you might have like a very like full like rounded sense of a situation through like a movie, like Rashomon or whatever, right? Multiple viewpoints at once. But what games very uniquely allow you to do is have the choice and live with it and sit with it. You know, obviously you can play a game, blah, 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 all these things, but you know, for a short period of time at least, you really get the feel, the sense. And you know, it's proven out like uh, for Fable, uh, which is a you know famous computer game developed in in England, right? Which is a fantasy game. Like it, it also kind of played with morality in a crude way, and they had a good path and a bad path. And one of the statistics they got back as they analyzed how people played it is that it turns out like almost nobody plays the bad path, right? Because even if there's no real consequences, like the fact that you make a choice makes most people act morally, right? No, you know, people don't kick a dog in a virtual space, right? That's kind of interesting. So like, you know, and they were like, oh, maybe the bad path was a wasted effort. You know, this is all kind of like interesting. So it, it takes real effort to kind of make those edges and also to make the experiences that not everybody else is going to experience. And I think that's like a very interesting, a very generous way of making art. So this is a lot easier than um, this is a lot easier than chasing that back and forth. So I, I I do think someone's going to end up building a dog kicking simulator, and I can already see the uh, I can already see the cogs turning in Ben's in Ben's brain. So Stefan, it, it feels tonight that you've been really uh, reaching for that promotion um, by acknowledging. <laughs> How wonderful it is that all the staff from Middlesex are here. So I do want to ask you, if you had to look at all of the games that you saw and all of the, the, the um, reviews that were given, if you had to synthesize this evening, um, how, would you, how would you do so? Well, first of all, uh, uh, my uh, uh, respects uh, and gratitude to those of you who have uh, uh, taken the um, uh, the effort and have reviewed these games for us. I uh, personally was uh, completely taken by Disco Elysium, which uh, I think um, just by means of his aesthetics 
has sort of uh, 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 drawn in. Um, but of course, um, as an academic and uh, 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 you know, cultural theorist, um, um, I'm also drawn to the trolley problem and to um, game theory as a way of uh, understanding complexity in social sciences and complexity, the notion of complexity in the context of, uh, of everyday life in, in, in our mass societies. And uh, I found your presentation incredibly charming and it looks like a lot of fun. What was it? Sock, uh, uh, sock um, futurism. Was it sock futurism? Sock futurism, I think, was uh, was one of these 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 terms that that stuck with me. Um, can games contribute to making the world a better place? Well, this is a, a an interesting question that we as games designers ask ourselves every day. Magnus, do you think that games have the um, potential? to steer society on a more um, prosperous path uh, uh, and a, a better path that we're pursuing now. Do you think, uh, uh, wow. as my line manager, <laughs> you, 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 you must know the truth. If I... <coughs> what I would say is this, is that um, there are cultural artifacts, there are cultural entities, and um, as such, for good or bad, it can be used. I'm always mindful of the stories around when, uh, surrounding that book, when, what's it called, when old technologies were new. And that the, the stories going on about, well, people always have these great, optimistic, but largely one sided views about how technologies can transform for good. And um, and guess what? It can be used for bad too. I think this is what I was trying to capturing in my introductory talk when I was talking about gamification and counter gamification, and uh, when we are looking at improving the world and making the world, trying to make the better uh, the world a better place with games. We need to see that the world we inhabit is already gamified. Generation of game at release, not the RPG itself. Then, so we keep evolving. We keep explaining the human story. Well, this is also an interesting, the typology of games, when Roger Calois talks about the typology of games, Alea, Argon, Elynx, Mimicry. So, um, games where we fight for competition, Agon, Agonal games, Alea, where it's really all about chance, the lottery, Mimicry, um, the game of fashion, um, Elynx, the game of uh, uh, the party. Um, I do want to turn to audience questions. Are there any burning audience <coughs> questions? There's one at the back, please. Uh, um, thank you for this fascinating, amazing, and inspiring event. Uh, it really is a lot of uh, fun and, and really interesting conversation, you know, from, uh, from the depths of Siberia and the past international connections and having those plots. Like, you know, I, as a, I was uh, in, in, in Britain as an international student 18 years ago, and I was used to go to internet cafes, and I still remember those plots. Uh, because, you know, not everybody had a, had a thing on their phone that would tell them all the time zone. So you rely on those plots to, to write to people. And yeah, it kind of takes me back and reveals my age to some extent. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm going to just throw this kind of at uh, Stefan and I, I want to encourage Jeff, everyone to reply because I think uh, kind of how, how this uh, commentary session has completed and how the whole session opened uh, sort of like dovetails quite a lot and like in the things are found together. Like I, I agree with you, uh, Stefan, because I'm a political economist, a social scholar uh, and a linguist and I uh, put you other different things. So uh, I very much seriously empathize, and I'm, I'm involved in the kind of demathematization of economics project at my university. And the whole kind of game theory uh, and game equals mathematical equations. 
is and uh, that assigned to social policy is what permeated educational sector, art sectors, you know, means testing, you know, whether this is profitable or not, all of that kind of stuff leads us to removing the, the ludic element, the creative element out of play, removing creativity, sucking it out of life. Right? So uh, I completely I completely agree with this kind of sentiment that you know, the very often when people think these days, because of this kind of permeation of one specific type, the like economistic mathematic type of game theory in everyday life, that when people think about games, they think about something that's regimental. They think about something that this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, but games does not equal rule. Um, so I want to I want to answer this question to everybody at the panel. Like, what is your perception of uh, this kind of, because I have this conversation with Simon frequently, that there is this conflation of gamification with rules rather than with play. Uh, and this kind of like mathematics and regimentation uh, instead of creativity. And what do we do about it? <laughs> I just want to respond to this. Yeah, so it's it's all it's all in Johann Heisinger and 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 Roger Calois who make this distinction between ludus, yeah, and um, what Margarete Jaman from the uh, ludic society uh, Austria calls jessence, playfulness, yeah. So a not rule based, playful way of interacting with the world that leads to discovery, that leads to creativity. Um, that, that leads to that, that is very much the distinction you can make. I mean, the, je sens, yeah, but it's not me making this distinction. No, 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 but it is one you could make, right? So, for instance, you could, you could argue that a game only exists as play with rules. And I think you get a long way with that. Well, it depends which of my modules you take, and it'll I depend on the idea. Yeah. I actually want to respond to that. I think there is like a, a bit of a linger confusion around like game theory, gamification and games. I don't necessarily think they're the same thing at all. Right? Like I think when we think about game theory and gamifications, we're really mainly thinking about the mechanics of gambling, right? And how to like hit people for a dopamine rush and like how to organize these things. And certainly these things are definitely present in a lot of video games and a lot of them some of them are very, very predatory and have a lot of gambling-like mechanics. But, but I wouldn't say that is the essence of games at all, right? You know, it's a combination of expressiveness and constraints and all these other things. And there are games that have absolutely nothing of what you would call gamification. So I think this association is a very unfortunate confluence of terms that we should discuss separately. And it's a shame we don't have the terminology really to separate those things currently. Bringing it back to <coughs> governance and politics, I think there is a very significant part of the conversation to keep having and have every time we can to remind people that yes, government and politics is gamified. And we do mean gamified in the kind of gamble, dopamine, A, B, on, off, win, lose kind of machine. So it brings me back to the conversation about play and something that, that Douglas uses humor with which is if you want to escape the game then you have to find some fairly radical playful alternative ways to behave and operate in society and i think that's a very big question for us to ask the contemporary state of gaming is completely homogenized and has no room for creativity you know if you take back in the 80s when i grew up there was a plethora of different kind of games that you'd have you know so for me on a creative level there has to be you know um a resurgence of people taking risks because we're just becoming you know in this banal field of the repetition of games for me so that was my you know what i'm glad uh, that you have the mic for one so uh, then we there we have it the world uh, we inhabit is already gamified and when we apply that logic to democracy and reality is that any fun for us who wins and who loses and on that note i just want you to put your hands together and please join me in thanking our incredible panelists
to see you here. Uh, the book that we edited, and there is lots of things about games in the book, there is lots of stories about gamers. Uh, the book is there, you just need to tap the donation to Newspeak House, 22 Ideas About the Future, Stephen the Editor. Uh, you just need to tap donation to Newspeak House and that little thing and you can take the book. And uh, a lot of conversations can continue uh, with what's in the book. But thank you very much for coming. Uh, we'll do another event on uh, Games for Good probably end of February, so sign up for our mailing list and hope to see you again. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.